So here's a fun bit of information. This evening's event not only features two guest hosts, Crystal Frost and Colleen Wares from WTCM's Crystal Frost Show, but it also happens to feature two authors, kind of, Sophie Kinsella and Madeline Wickham. Sophie Kinsella wrote her first novel under her given name, Madeline Wickham, when she was just 24 years old and working as a financial journalist. That book, The Tennis Party, was immediately hailed as a success by critics and the public alike and became a top 10 bestseller. She went on to publish six more novels under that name. Then she submitted her first Sophie Kinsella book anonymously to her existing publisher and it was snapped up without her editors knowing that she was really already one of their authors. <laughs> now I'm sure that most of us at one point or another in this room have wanted to reinvent ourselves somehow. Madeline Wickham did that more than once. A financial journalist turned best-selling author turned number one uh, international best-selling author by the name of Sophie Kinsella. The most recent book, her most recent book, Shopaholic to the Stars, landed in bookstores just yesterday, and she landed in Traverse City earlier this afternoon and even managed to do a little shopping downtown this afternoon before coming here to the Opera House. <laughs> she is on book tour in the United States for the first time in more than four years, making appearances in New York, California, and Michigan. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Crystal Frost, Colleen Wares, Sophie Kinsella, and Madeline Wickham to the City Opera House stage. Well, good evening. Good evening. It's lovely to be here. Hi. Hi. I feel like... Um, we should probably have a toast first. How about this? That is <laughs> such a good idea. <laughs> I if like this uh, event if, already. If you have anything to drink in the audience, please join us in a, a toast to Madeline Wickham, Sophie Kinsella. Well, here's to you guys. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Well, that's nice. So we're here to talk about uh, the Shopaholic series, and especially the Shopaholic to the Stars, your latest in um, mm -hmm. what has been such a successful uh, series of novels, really. So I wanted you to just kind of give a premise of, of what the books are, uh, especially this one, because this takes a really different direction than the previous mm -hmm. um, Becky books, as a lot of people call them. Yes, exactly. Well, um, hello everybody. It's really lovely to be here. And um, I guess I need to start by telling you who Becky Bloomwood is, um, if, if you don't know her already. She's quite a character. She is the archetypal shopaholic. And in the first novel, we meet her 20-something single girl in London working as a financial journalist. So actually her job is to tell people how to manage their money. This is her job. But her own money consists of visa bills hidden under the bed and running away from her bank manager and not managing her affairs well at all. Um, and that was the, sort of the introduction to Becky. She's had many adventures since then. She's met the love of her life. She's been married. She's had a baby. Each time with a kind of sense of catastrophe, mayhem, and complete shambles happening, she gets herself into really embarrassing, tricky situations, but somehow always manages to get the, herself out of them. I mean, one example being in Shopaholic Ties the Knot, she can't decide which kind of wedding to have. Does she have the lovely wedding at home in her mother's garden in Surrey in England? Or does she have the plaza wedding, which her mother-in-law is offering her in New York, a society ground wedding? She can't decide. So what does she do? She goes into denial mode and lets both weddings take shape and the weeks tick by and she doesn't know what she's gonna do and she can't bear to say no to either of them. Um, she gets out of it in the end, although I must admit I was quite panicked as I was writing that book. <laughs> Oh my God, what is she going to do? Um, so that gives you a flavor of, of Becky and her world. And here she is um, in Hollywood. And this has been a really exciting book to, re to, to write. Well, I don't know, I read, I hope. Write, it certainly was. Um, partly inspired by my own experiences in Hollywood because um, my first, well, the first two books really were turned into a movie. Uh, Confessions of a Shopaholic. So I got plunged into the world of LA and films and, and movie sets and, and the whole thing. 
And all the time I kept thinking, what would Becky make of all this? What would Becky do? And I couldn't wait to take her to Hollywood and to put her in some of the bizarre and surreal experiences that I had. So this is her landing in LA. Um, she's there with her husband, Luke, and decides that her new career simply must be celebrity stylist. She loves clothes. She loves celebrities. You know, it's clearly the perfect job for her. Now she just has to make her way into Hollywood. And it, every, ba every attempt backfires. She falls flat on her face. She causes mayhem on the red carpet, on a studio lot, on a movie set. It's just one catastrophe after another. Until there's a bit of a twist, and I'm not going to give the book away, but there is a twist and suddenly things are going her way. And then she sort of gets sucked into that kind of Hollywood celebrity culture, which I think we've all become aware of over the last, you know, however many years. And so she kind of lets it go to her head a bit. Um, one of my favorite scenes I think I've ever written is Becky deciding that she's so grand and important that she must now hire a bodyguard, um, which is something I never did, can I just say. Um, so she, she has some tough choices to make in the end. Let's just leave it at that. Um, it was fun to write, and I, I hope that you, those of you who read it will really enjoy it. I think it's definitely a very enjoyable book, and thank you so much for giving us such a, a great description of it, especially uh, I think it's amazing the way that you talk about, I don't know which way she's going to go, and especially Shopaholic gets married. Um, it it's, it's just has to be so interesting as you're writing uh, to really not know where you're going to go as the pages are turning. Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I find that I, I plan, I am a great planner when I write, um, but things take over as you're writing. I always like to have an ending in my head, but it's not always the ending. And sometimes you'll find that your characters just surprise you. And often when I'm writing dialogue, suddenly somebody will say something and I'll be like, oh, okay then, fine, <laughs> we'll do that. And, and off you go in a new direction. So it is, it's a kind of adventure. Do you have a particular ritual, I guess, um, when you start to write a, a book, especially in the Shopaholic series, when you realize that you're going to sit down and write Shopaholic to the stars, do you have a ritual? Do you have music you listen to? Um, do you shop at home? I mean, do you shop, <laughs> do I shop at home? Do you yes. shop at home? Do you work <laughs> at home? Um, it, you know, it depends which stage of the book I'm at, because when I'm planning, um, I like to get out of the house. I actually like to go to the mall, if I'm honest, because I find it inspiring, you know? If I'm gonna write about Becky, I want to kind of be in her world, so I do a lot of sitting in coffee shops. I love coffee shops, because they're kind of anonymous, but you're kind of with humanity all around you. It's buzzy, there's music. And I spend a lot of time just thinking, plotting, planning, before I start to write, because there's nothing worse than starting to write a book too soon before you really know what it's all about. So I kind of wait until I'm bursting to write this book. And then I do, I, I, I shut the door, I put on very loud kind of upbeat music. Um, I tend to get obsessed by a particular song and just play it over <laughs> and over for each book. And it will be something you know that I'm not listening to. It's not music to listen to. It's music to kind of act as a sound barrier to energize me. Something like Daft Punk, Scissor Sisters, you know, almost like aerobics music. Um, and and it's sort of it, it's great because it gives me a cocoon, my little world that I'm I'm writing in. And so, do you write at home at an in an office? I do. I do. I go to the top of the house. I shut the door. <laughs> you need to, and I, I wanted to tell everyone this beforehand. Sophie has five children, ages two through 18. Yeah, and, and everything in between. And, and, and we can do any <laughs> size, they're all in stock. <laughs> <laughs> all varieties. And we joked when we came to soundcheck, that, too, that I couldn't even be on time, and I have a dog. And, <laughs> and she writes novels and has five kids between two and 18, and writes at home. How, how do you manage that? Well, you know, um, a very big door that shuts. <laughs> With a lock? <laughs> yeah. I think it's like anybody juggling, you know, the work and, and the children. You just sort of have to make it work however you can. And I mean, on the plus side, you know, my commute is very short. Um, and I'm able to be flexible. If one of them is ill, I can take time off. So, you know, I, I have those advantages. 
And I think that they know that sometimes I will be a bit distracted. And that's what does happen because when I'm really in a book, it takes over. I'm, I'm living it. I'm, you know, I, I am being my heroine, really. I'm living it with her. And my head is, is, is in that place. So I might be kind of cooking and doling out food or even <laughs> having a conversation about how it was your day, darling. But actually, in, in my head, I've kind of got bits of dialogue. And, and they kind of know that. And they also know that I might at any moment rush off, scribble a few words down or tap something on the laptop and they all have to wait, and then it's like, okay, as we were, carry on. Um, <laughs> that's my parenting style, what can I say? <laughs> well, you could always just leave a jar of peanut butter open and, and say, I'll be back in a couple of weeks. Now, there, that, yeah, okay, I'll try that one. <laughs> with a note. <laughs> so Break do you ever note. suffer from writer's block at all? With all this going on around you and really a lot of responsibility, people are, are waiting on you to produce new products. Yeah. Do you ever suffer from writer's um, block? And what do you do? When, well, I'll when tell you, do? you something. I did an event many, many years ago when I was very new to this game. And it was with a, um, a much older author. He was a fantasy writer. And he, we were asked this question. And he said very firmly, I never suffer from writer's block. And I thought, wow, that's punchy. Um, well done, you. And <laughs> afterwards in the bar, he explained to me this theory, which I have clung to ever since which is that if you say something out loud, whether you believe it or not, your brain takes it in and at some level believes it. And if you say it over and over, your brain will start to believe it. And make it true. And make it true. So I do not suffer from writer's block. <laughs> Just keep repeating it. It will happen. Um, if I get temporarily stuck, let's put it like that, um, I find walking, getting out of the house, do not sit and stare at the computer screen. It's just death. You know, you have to move, you have to think of other things. Um, cocktails, also very useful. <laughs> <laughs> so do you work on one project at a time or do you have maybe a shopaholic book going here and something in a different genre getting started over there or do you take it one project at a time? Well, I kind of have one that I'm actually writing, but then I have others that I'm thinking about. And I mean, right now, I'm, I'm juggling kind of promoting this book. I'm writing another shopaholic book. I have vague thoughts in my head about another future book. And I just wrote um, my first young adult book, which is exciting. And that's due to come out in 2015. Right? Yeah. So wow. I've been doing edits on that recently as well. So I have been juggling a few plots. But it's nice. They kind of, I think they feed off each other and it keeps you alive. You really like to juggle between the kids and the book writing. And this is... Yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's not that I set out to make my... I have, I have to say, my husband did say, really? When I said, oh, I'm going to write this young adult book, he was like, do you not have enough on your plate? <laughs> what are you doing? But the thing is, when you have an idea and you want to write it, it just takes over. It's so exciting. It's the best feeling in the world. It really is. So you do make it happen. And you kind of just... I mean, I would say I do not go to many exhibitions and galleries. You know, <laughs> hobbies, not so much. So, you know, I'm kind of waiting for the time when my life settles down and I can perhaps start, you know, going to museums and cultural events and perhaps run a marathon. I don't know what I'll do. I don't have time for it now, but, I, you know, this is, this is how I'm choosing to, to lead my life, and, and it's great. So you're, you're processing ideas and you're writing them down, you're running to the other room and doing that. Is that how it first started, your transition to being mm -hmm. a novelist? Did you have an idea and say... I am going to transfer this in, into a novel, or did someone say, you ought to write a novel, and then you came up with the idea? Well, what really happened was that I, I loved words. I, was, I knew I loved writing. I really hated writing about pensions. Um, uh, yeah. And I really hated facts. Terrible at facts. I'm not interested in facts, really. I don't remember them. <laughs> if people tell me stuff, I forget it. And yet you were a financial journalist. Yeah, okay. this, yes, you're noticing the flaw. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I was like, well, I, I love writing, and I was commuting to my job, and I would read paperbacks. You know, every day I would just read voraciously. And one day it sort of just hit me, wait, this is what I want to do. This is, it's this these are the kind of words I want to be writing. 
And I mean, I didn't know if I could do it or not, but the minute I started writing The Tennis Party, which eventually was published, I just felt like, you know, a duck plopping into the water for the first time and thinking, yes, finally, these web feet make sense. It, it was like, this is, this is how I work best. Um, and I had a few f false starts, you know. I, I think I had the desire to write a book, and then I kind of cast around for some ideas and had a few, you know, chapter one, oh dear, painful, terrible, try again. Uh, when I had the idea for the tennis party, it just kind of fell into place. And, um, and, and that was where it all began, and it's, you know, I haven't really looked back. So I mean, would you consider yourself, I, most writers can't call themselves overnight success stories or anything like that, but did you ever have any rejection slip horror stories that uh, you have experienced in your writing career? Um, I did start off, yeah, I, I think I sent a book off early on. But, you know, to be fair, it was more like, this isn't quite it, you know, try again. Um, I would say the rejection slips have more come from myself, mm -hmm. that I, I tried writing this style. It's really hard, you know, because you, when you're a reader and you think, I'd like to write a book, you might admire so many different kinds of book. And how do you know which one is going to be your voice? Um, I mean, I did have an almighty rejection, actually, once. Having started writing, I got really into Patricia Cornwell and sort of thrillers and things. And I thought, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a thriller. This is just so great. <laughs> um, and I plotted out this thriller. It was really quite gory. Um, and I started, I wrote a few chapters and I showed it to my agent and she looked at it she said well it's all very well you know you've got a not not a bad plot but all your characters are so nice you know you cannot write this thriller with with just these nice people trotting around <laughs> being all kind of witty and funny and then they kill each other this won't do <laughs> so that was a bit of a rejection I thought yeah she said she said this would need to be gritty and I kind of thought Gritty, mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Gritty and me is not really going to work. So, so I went back to you know what I knew best. Yeah, I don't. I couldn't see you doing gritty. Um, <laughs> you're you're just way too well mannered and eloquent yeah, for that. Yeah, it, it was not a good fit, <laughs> me and gritty. So you know, if we have some young writers in the audience uh, that may or may not be looking to be discovered, mm -hmm. do you have any tips for those writers? Well, um, I think the most important thing when you want to start writing is to find your voice because that is what will help you connect with readers and make what you do kind of truthful and powerful. And it's not easy to do, especially if you're a reader because, you know, if you're a good writer, the chances are that you pick up on style, you pick up on dialogue, you hear things. I mean, I am a complete parrot. I start copying people's accents. And, and so it's actually hard to, 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 to sort of distinguish between what's a great influence from your reading and what you're actually just kind of copying. And we all start by imitating people that we admire. But what you need to do is find your own personal voice. Who are you? And it may take some false starts. Um, and, and the advice that I always say when people say, well, you know, what book shall I, shall I write? I say, what book would you like to read? And I tell them to imagine going into a bookshop and seeing the perfect book, the book that just makes them so excited, they want to pick it up straight away. And we've all got a book that would do that to us, you know, whether it's a thriller or if it's a romance or it's a great comedy or a character or a title, write that book because it hasn't been written yet, someone needs to write it, that person is you, and the chances are that if it made you leap up and down with excitement, then it will make other people leap up and down. So kind of don't try and please anybody, whether, I mean, if you're very young, you know, even teachers, don't, don't write for them, critics, write for yourself, what would make you happy, and hopefully other people will like it too. That's really great advice. You know, your Shopaholic series has been referred to as chiclet. Mm. Uh, is that a, a term that you're offended by, or do you just Chiclet sort of... has become an old friend to me. <laughs> We've been through our ups and downs. You know, um, what can I say? What does it even mean? I mean, that's the thing. People say, are you offended? And I say, well, you know, if you take it to mean contemporary intelligent literature, possibly with a female heroine, possibly exploring issues of the day, and really funny and great, then yeah. Totally. 
that's what I do. Um, I mean, there are other terms I think would be would be better because they don't define the readership as female. I think anybody with a sense of humor could read my books. And I know men read my books. Because the other day I did a signing and I was writing to Kevin, to Chuck, to Gregory. So, you know, um, I mean, I, I like chic lit, which I saw the other day. Yeah, I like chic, chic lit. lit. Or yeah. in a bookshop once I saw wit lit. I loved that. Um, I mean, I, you know, romantic comedy is another term. I mean, you know, People kind of know what you mean. Um, I, I don't mind it, but I think there are more imaginative phrases that we could use. You know, I, obviously millions of people love your books, um, which could probably be interesting in several scenarios. Like if you see someone come up to you and they just feel like they know you, that sort of parasocial relationship, does that, is that awkward at first when people just say, oh gosh, it's Sophie. and. I remember when you did this and thinking that you're Becky. Yeah, no, it, you know, it, it happens all the time. I mean, people do confuse me and Becky, and um, <laughs> I can't think why. And, and people do f feel as if they know me because, well, no, not exactly know me, but it's like we're kind of mutual friends. We have a mutual friend in common, and that friend is Becky. And, and so we sort of feel connected. But you know what? It's lovely. It's just amazing because when I meet readers, that we kind of smile, like, oh, hi, yeah, you know. <laughs> do you remember that time when Becky did that thing? God, wasn't that embarrassing? <laughs> and it's kind of almost like we're connected already. Um, and I find it a really sort of heartwarming thing. And, it, and it's wherever I go, you know, it's not just a kind of English language thing, even in other countries, in sort of Italy or wherever it might be. It just feels like, like we've kind of, we all have the same outlook on life and this kind of mindset. And I think it's a, just a lovely thing. I do have to ask where you got your skirt because it's fabulous. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so glad. It has pearls so, on it. Can I just look? It's got <laughs> pearls on the skirt. I mean, what is not to love? Um, I got it. Um, there's a boutique uh, as part of this brilliant, I mean, do you know Topshop? It is our staple fashion kind of mecca in London. And on the bottom floor, I'm giving you very specific instructions so that <laughs> you can go and get it. If you go to the bottom floor, they have all these other labels. And this is by a label I didn't know before. It's called CC, C-I, C-I. And they had all these amazing, like, jeweled clothes. I was like, this is a skirt and an accessory all in one. It so that sounds like something that Becky might say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you mean. It's very chic bedazzled, though. I mean, it, it really is. I love it. Chic lit, what can I say? <laughs> so what would you say that you and Becky have in common? Absolutely nothing. No, not, not. Not a... Uh, I have to ask you that, though, because Becky is kind of a klutz. Is Sophie a little bit of oh, a klutz? God, yes. <laughs> yes. I have had so many terrible moments. So many terrible... Oh, I... Like, in Italy, table full of journalists who are due to interview me tomorrow. And I've got this new sheepskin coat, which I'm really proud of. And so the waiter comes over to give it to me. It's quite a crowded restaurant. And instead of doing the sensible thing, which is, thank you so much, I will now put this over my arm and carry it out and put it on in the street. I can't resist putting it on with a sort of whoosh jug of water all over the journalists. <laughs> Nightmare. Thank God it wasn't wine, is all I can say. Um, I mean, I just, in fact, things that happen in my books tend to come true, which is really worrying. I mean, this, this, this book opens, okay, and Becky is in this changing room, and she's struggling yes. with a really stretchy garment, and I'm sure a lot of people will have had this hideous experience where you try something on, and you get stuck, and you're on your own, and you're like, oh, oh, oh. It's horrible. Anyway, so I wrote this scene, and I thought, oh, poor old Becky, huh, how embarrassing. Um, it made me laugh. <laughs> And that was that. And then fast forward to a few weeks ago, and I am totally in the same position, in a stretchy bandage, wrapped dress. But it's even worse, because um, instead of a shop assistant waiting for me, it's an Italian stylist at a photo shoot, a male Italian stylist called Mikhail, who is like completely chic. And the idea that me, mother of five, is gonna let Mikhail, he's going, Sophie, are you ready, Sophie? And I'm stuck. <laughs> and I'm like, you're not coming in and hauling a dress off me, Mikhail, <laughs> you know, with your Italian loafers. It's just not happening. 
so it was awful. So I had to call my husband. And he came in and he started trying to hold this. He was like, what is this stupid bloody dress? And I was like, it's fashion. It's Italian fashion. And it took us about half an hour. And we came out. Our hair was on end. We were red in the face. But they were Italian. So they were like, it's fine. You've got to do what you've got to do. I don't know what they thought we were doing. They were just like, have a cigarette. <laughs> Anyway, and, and so what I said, I wrote it and it came true. <laughs> this is worrying. I'm not going to write my version of Gone Girl because where would that end up? <laughs> yes, exactly. Although I have to tell you, I did think about Fifty Shades of Shopaholic. What do you think? <laughs> well, you know, you can dream. You know, since millions of people do love your book, though, and, and, and it is about shopping, mm. do you think that makes us materialistic? All of you. Sorry, you're doomed. <laughs> doomed. Um, do you know, I think it's just, I, I, I think it's human nature. I think all of human nature is materialistic. And I think, you know, we're programmed that way because, I mean, I have been thinking about this. And back in the day when we were cavemen, how did we survive? We survived if we went out and got stuff, whether it was firewood or a bear or, you know, a bear's skin to look really fabulous in. <laughs> And that was how we survived. And, and we have this impulse to protect ourselves with the stuff that we need. And I think, obviously, we don't need any of the stuff that we buy. But it's kind of in us. And it's not just women. It's men. Men don't need that new Apple gadget that they're all camped outside in Oxford Street in the tents. But they're doing it. So I think that a, a very few of us have the rare quality not to need any things at all. Most of us, it's in us, to some degree or other, and to, in Becky, to a large degree. So it's not materialistic, it's, it's just, um, it's biological. I think so. There you go. Survival. That's my it's survival. <laughs> Dr. Kinsella speaks. <laughs> so okay. to shift gears just a little bit, your novels have been so popular that uh, a major motion picture was made, what, covered two of the books? Yeah, yeah, they kind of did a mashup of, of, con of the first one and the second one. So tell us a little bit about your experience with that. I'm curious if you're, you were happy with the movie, if you consulted on it, if you felt a little protective maybe about the characters Everything, in the story? Everything, all of the above. Um, of course I was protective, you know, it's your baby. And um, I think, Probably every author, when they sell their books for film, they ideally would like to see page one, page two on the screen, page three, completely as it is, and you know, a film that would last you know, 10 hours, nobody would go to see it. Um, <laughs> and, and I think you, you have to learn that that's not how a film works, and you've handed it over. So there were plot changes, and, and many changes really, characters invented and all kinds of things, none of which I had anything to do with, because while it was in development, I was not part of that process at all. It was just lots of people off in California you know, the years went by, by the way. This took, I mean, it was bought for film before it was even published. It took 10 years to come to the screen, most of which I just sat there thinking, oh, well, maybe there'll be a film one day, maybe not. And then when they started shooting, suddenly they invited me to kind of come on the set and be involved and become a consultant. And so I had this sort of extraordinary plunge into the film world, which was fascinating. And I mean, I thought Isla Fisher was brilliant. Even more so, I mean, you know, if you watch the film, you think she's brilliant. If you've seen her working, you think she's even more brilliant because you've seen her do that funny thing 12 times. Even more, you know, funny variations, improvisation. So that was stunning. And I, I think for me, the most important thing was that they kept the comedy and the heart and the, the kind of the sweetness of Becky. And I thought Ida really did that brilliantly. And you guys are best friends now. Obviously we're best friends. Obviously. Yeah, she's, she's just there. Have you, right. Did you see her? <laughs> I'm waving at her right yeah. now. Yeah, hi Isla. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess, um, what is your definition of a shopaholic? Ooh, interesting. Okay, the thing about the word shopaholic is that, you know, it's, again, it's a nebulous term. We use it like we want, in, however we want to use it. So I think there's a spectrum, is the truth of it. And at one end of the spectrum is some really sad stuff, some really 
damaged people who go way too far and, and, and hurt their, themselves and their families. And, and that is a horrible thing. And that's when it sort of tips over into a really bad place. And then there's sort of up, 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 up. And then there's people who really just say, oh, you know, I bought myself a shirt today. I'm such a shopaholic. And they're not really at all. Um, but they've just felt that tiny little buzz, that little free song of, oh, I've bought something. Oh, it's nice. Oh, I'm looking in the shop windows. And then sort of through the spectrum, and everybody knows their place. Everybody knows those deep down little free songs they get when they flicking through a catalogue or looking online or you see a new lawnmower and you think, oh, I want that lawnmower. I mean, it really, it's, it's not all about clothes and shoes, you know, some sporting equipment. Everybody has the thing that makes them tick. And I think it's, it's that addictive quality that turns you into a shopaholic. So the, the shop windows are the gateway drug, really. The sh well, too many gateway drugs. I mean, really, we're bombarded. The sh the, for me, it's the email that pops into my inbox and says, did you know there's a sale on at the White Company? I'm like, well, I didn't, but now I do. So, <laughs> it's, it, you know, we, we are assailed. Uh, they text you, they, they come at you from all directions. You know, you spoke about... Um, it, the, the dark side of being a shopaholic, where it really can ruin lives, and it really can have an impact on families. And, you know, worldwide, we have struggled with debt, uh, recession, and job loss, and do you feel a little bit of a, as your role is, is not necessarily to maybe make Becky declare bankruptcy, but instead um, teach people that it's still fun to uh, it, the world is still fun out there, even in the middle of all of this financial crisis. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that debt is, has become this topic which we all talk about. And what I find so interesting is that when I wrote the first Shopaholic book, debt was not the topic it is today. And I kind of feel like I was ahead of the curve because <laughs> the first Shopaholic book charts this girl being invited to take out debt. And it begins with letters from financial institutions saying, Dear Miss Bloomwood, we would like to invite you to take out lots of debt. Why not come and take out this credit card? Take out this overdraft. Take out this loan. And then throughout the book, you see the letters going, you haven't paid back your loan. Now we're going <laughs> to clobber you for fines and we're going to cut up your card. And, you know, it's the pattern that the whole world has fallen into, which is, you know, easy debt. It's also lovely. Let's spend too much. And then the consequences. And the thing is that she does spend too much. Of course she does. But she suffers consequences, you know, each time, boom, she, she, she has to do something about it, whether it's selling all her things or, I mean, in, in the one before this, mini shopaholic, um, the recession hits and she, people said to me, oh, but how can you write Becky with the, the financial crisis? And I was like, no, 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 bring it on. This is totally the place I should be writing Becky Bloomwood and her response to it. And I mean, she, she really, she goes for it. She says, right, I'm gonna wear everything in my wardrobe three times before I can buy anything new. And she has a lot of clothes, so this is gonna take her five years. So she gets very depressed. <laughs> and then she says that she's not gonna buy anything anymore. She's only going to barter. She's gonna swap. So she then starts trying to swap all her stuff and that goes horribly wrong. I mean, you know, she does her best. She and her mum go to the pound shop um, do you have the pound shop? We don't. The dollar shop? Oh, we Every do have the dollar, dollar store. store. Right, dollar store. And, they, and they go, they have no, they've never been in this place before. They keep going, how much is this one? <laughs> and they go, a pound. Wow. And how much is this? A pound. So, <laughs> so you know, um, it, it's, it's, Becky is just like any, any of us struggling with these, these huge yeah. events, but not giving up on life and maybe just shopping differently, not saying, well, I cannot leave the house, I cannot spend any money, but I'm gonna do it differently. So she's a thrift shopaholic. <laughs> yes, okay, that's the next book. Well, she may, shopaholic. <laughs> she may be somewhat redeemed though, because in the new book that was just released yesterday, Shopaholics of the Stars, which by the way, will be on sale out in the lobby when we're finished. Uh, Becky's hired on as a personal shopper, which means that she shops with other people's money. For other people. Oh my goodness. This is a license to shop. And it's her dream job. Yeah. Well, and so how does it shift? What sort of a shift in her character? 
to no, explain. No, it's the same old then. Becky. Same it's Becky. Just, same same Becky or someone else's it's money. Just, it's just when Luke says, what are these coats doing under the bed? She can say, they're not for me. They're for a client. Um, it's, it kind of is another of Becky's justifications, and it's the perfect one. Is it hard for her to give up the coats, though, from her possession? Very hard, yeah. <laughs> I think this must be true of all stylists. You oh, know, yeah. how many of the clothes actually make it onto the celebrities' backs? <laughs> You just have to try everything out first. Uh, you did mention her husband, uh, and Becky is now married. Uh, she has a baby. How are those things figuring into the plots that you have cooking in your head for these new uh, shopaholic ideas coming out? Oh, they're completely integral. I mean, the thing about the shopaholic books is they're not just the story of a girl. They are the story of a world. And what I find is I've built up this cast of characters Becky, Luke, her best friend, Suze, the mum and dad who are just such a grounding force in her life. And really, I have to take them all along, you know, for the ride. So I don't really think of it as so much just what is Becky doing next, as, as what, what's happening in Becky's world. And it's unthinkable that I would write a book in which Luke and his concerns, Minnie, that's her daughter, Minnie Shopaholic, um, <laughs> You know, what's Minnie up to? And so when I, when I start to create the next book, it really is like looking at everybody. What are they all doing? It's like this massive catch-up, you know? You know, one of the things I like most about the Shopaholic series is that she and her husband, Luke, they have a really supportive marriage. And I think that's something that you don't... You know, they have their issues, obviously, but it's something you don't see so much, in, um, especially in romantic comedy these days. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of kind of feeling that, oh, well, it's boring if, if they're happily married. And I really don't agree. I think there's just, there's shades of a happy marriage. There's ups and downs. And yes, you know, they've had problems. There's been, you know, the hint of another woman. That was pretty hairy for a bit. Yeah. But essentially, they are a strong unit. And I like writing that. I feel that it's a it's a, a platform for Becky to have her adventures, and I think it would be quite tedious if if I was just focused on Becky and Luke. Are they together? Have they? You know, they're good. They're essentially they're good, and let's see what else is going on in their lives. You know, yeah, and I think that that's something that um, is just missing out there a little bit. That everybody wants to find the drama, you know. So it's. Is she going to end up with him? Join us next week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Answer yes. <laughs> Still together. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you were, you've had a busy day today. I watched you on CBS this morning. Right. You were in yeah. New York today. And uh, you said that shopping is a feeling. It's a lust. And is that the feeling? Is it the lust that drives Becky in Shopaholic to the Stars, would you say? Oh, do you know, it's... it's like she not, just can't get enough. Do you know, it's, it's not just a lust for the shopping. And I mean, in Shopaholic to the Stars, her, she's a very obsessional character, Becky, and her obsession sort of slightly shifts focus um, to this new career that she wants to pursue and, and this idea that she will become not just a stylist, but a celebrity stylist. And, and she kind of gets a taste of celebrity and perhaps she could become a name and perhaps she could end up on the red carpet in her own right you know Becky in front of the cameras and that I think is a kind of lust is a kind of you know you taste it's like the piranhas scenting a bit of blood you get a taste of that and you want a bit more 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 and she's she's always been starstruck and now she gets she lets it go to her head and the shopping is kind of part of that um, and I think that's a very specific sort of journey for her in this book. It's not just about kind of going to a department store and buying something. It's about something bigger. It's about who does she want to be as a person and what is she prepared to sacrifice. Um, and, you know, she goes to a quite, a, quite an extreme place, I would say, in this book, one that she hasn't been to before. And I think that's because Hollywood is quite an extreme place. So, it, you know, it, that's the journey she had to take. You know, we didn't uh, get to mention much about this, but you actually didn't start out in writing at all, even though you were a financial journalist, but you have a background in music. 
Yes, I do. Can you I tell do. us a little bit about that? <laughs> well, I was, um, you know, people say, oh, did you want to be a novelist as a child? And I, I, I always liked words and stories and writing. But I was that kid who plays the piano for sort of three hours a day and the violin. And, and, I, and I really, music was my thing. And I went up to Oxford to read music. That was what I was going to do. And I think it was there that I had this sort of slight moment of, oh, actually, I've done enough music, you know? Um, sorry, everybody who taught me for all those years. Uh, <laughs> but I think there's this, this feeling that because you can do something, you should do it. And actually, that's not the case. I could play the piano, but it wasn't the thing I should be doing. And, and I changed from studying music to uh, doing politics, philosophy, and economics, which is the most brilliant course, especially philosophy. And I, the minute I found philosophy, I was like, this is the best subject. There are no facts at all. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> you know, it's just thinking. I can do thinking. Um, and I think that was really when I changed direction. And um, they had this amazing system in Oxford. I don't know if they still do it, but you have these tutorials, which is you and perhaps a tutorial partner and your tutor, that's it, and you read your essay aloud every week, and then it gets ripped to bits by the tutor and the partner. And there is nothing that like... That sounds fantastic. Yeah, it's intense. <laughs> um, but you learn, you learn to write, you le and, and you know, to try and make what you're doing a snappy, and you learn when it's boring, and I was always trying to shoehorn jokes into my philosophy essays. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, come on, let's make this amusing. Um, so I think that's where it all started, really. But I had to kind of let go of music a bit and think, no, I, you know, that doesn't have to be me. And again, with the reinventing, I'm a great believer in reinventing yourself. So you don't, you don't practice music at all anymore? I play a bit. You know, I, my husband was also a former opera singer, so we sometimes, you know, perform. Um, but just for fun. And our children now do music, so I spend most of my time bashing out, you know, a major scale with my nine-year-old or something. <laughs> well, you had put out uh, top 10 tips for being a best-selling author. And I think that maybe some of the young authors in the audience might to, like, like to hear some of your suggestions. I, I liked number one, and I think it's essential too, and it's carry a notebook always. Yes, yes, you, oh, you need to grab your ideas because you don't know when they're going to hit you. And it's all very well sitting down at your desk and thinking, right, now I shall have an idea for a novel. <laughs> yeah, still waiting. It's not like that. And the number of times I've been caught out, I've, I've been known to ask waiters for pens in restaurants. Ooh. And I remember once scribbling down some idea in lip liner on a receipt, which was really not ideal, because it completely smudged. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, so I've learned you need a notebook, you need a pen. Also by your bed, because you'll wake up and you might have thought of something as you wake up, or even dreamed something, or you know, the early morning is a really great time for ideas. Um, and now, actually, I, I send myself little emails on the BlackBerry, which is, you know, at least then I'm not going to lose them, because there's nothing worse than you think, oh, I had the best idea of my life, and I, I don't know which bag it's in. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and you also suggest to start to see the world in a what-if kind of way, to keep your possibilities open for a story. Mm. I, think, I think you do start to see the world sort of with a writer's eyes, and a book starts with something tiny, something really tiny. You know, you don't have to wait until a fully fledged novel pops into your brain. All you need is something interesting or intriguing. Like I remember I wrote this book called Can You Keep a Secret? And it's about a girl who sits next to a man on a plane and spills all her secrets to him, thinking he's a stranger, little realizing that this is the CEO of her company. Um, and. <laughs> And that, I, 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 for, the, for the longest time, I just had this idea, what if somebody, somebody knew all your secrets? And that's all I had. I just had, what if somebody knew all your you know, really embarrassing secrets? And I kind of carried that idea around for about a year, not really knowing you know, what I was going to do with it, just knowing I wanted to write it. And then, and then you know, the characters then, I, I kind of, they came to me and I kind of developed it. But it was just a tiny germ, and you have to realize that, you know, if you have a tiny idea and you don't know what to do with it, hang on to it, because it might turn into something really great. And you also suggest, 
don't talk about what you're writing. That's interesting. To well, me. I know, and I appreciate that if you're in a you know weekly writers workshop, that's going to be a, a harder task. So you know, <laughs> everyone does things differently, and um, I just find that I can't talk about what I'm doing. Certainly, do not talk about writing a novel rather than writing it, which is what a lot of people do. <laughs> You know, oh, that novel, and I'm going to do it. And if I just had the time, and I've just got so many ideas, and, you know, that can waste a whole evening. You could have written a thousand words. So um, I find that I can't talk about my work, only to my husband. He's, we have a kind of tight little sort of focus group, if you like. Because writers are really sensitive. We all are. And it's so easy for someone to just say something. And they're trying to be helpful. You know, and it kind of crushes you. Well, why don't you try that? And you think, what, you mean that my original idea wasn't any good? What, you, you don't like it? And, and it kind of, somebody once said, you know, that ideas are like butterflies. And I, I think it's true. They're just so fragile. They, they need sort of a warm environment to flourish and not the cold air of someone else's opinion. So, you know, protect your, your own creative process because it's fragile and show when you are feeling robust enough to take what will come, which is someone else's point of view, maybe criticism, you know, other ideas. And that's great, but you have to be in the right place. You can't, you can't have that stuff too early, or it, or it can kind of just mess you up. Do you ever read what the critics write about you? Are you compl do you sometimes take their uh, reviews, hide, lock yourself into the bathroom, read them and cry all day? Or? Cry all day, all <laughs> night, the tissues. Go do you shopping. Know, I have to say, it's, I have actually s stopped kind of looking at internet, every internet review that's going, because what you do is you bypass anything positive, and you find that one person who says, oh, it was really boring, and then you just beat yourself up all day. It's, you know, it's horrible. And actually, there's no point. Um, you know, sometimes I'll get a review in a paper that will say something really, you know, insightful, and I'll think, oh, wow, yeah, really good point. And I'm really receptive to comments from my editors and from, you know, the people that I respect. But do I endlessly Google myself for reviews in order to weep? I used to. <laughs> but I've kind of, I've got over that because... Because actually what it does is it stops you writing. It means that you have a week of thinking, oh God, why didn't they like that bit? You know, what am I going to do about that? And actually, you know, I have five kids. Hello, I don't really have time for that. So just <laughs> onward, <laughs> onward. You also say in your, uh, in your tips for new writers to get a great agent and also mm -hmm. consider a pseudonym. Can we talk about your pseudonym, Sophie Kinsella, when it comes to this tip? Yeah, I think everybody should have a pseudonym. I mean, writers or no writers. Choose a different name. It's fun. It's great. You know, have a name for work, a name for dating, a name for shopping. <laughs> I love it. Um, it's a really unexpected bonus um, to, to sort of have this work name, uh, which, you know, has, has become quite well known. And then I have my own name, which is less well known. And, and it actually, it means I have complete privacy. I go around... I am who I am. And then when I'm out and about and I'm Sophie Kinsella, then it's, it's more of a kind of, you know, work, work thing. It's my writing persona. But I like having, having the two. Um, and it feels like me. It's, it's my middle name, Sophie, and it's my mother's maiden name, Kinsella. It's not a random made-up name. I have family called Kinsella. I was very nearly christened Sophie in the first place. So it does feel like me. It's just a different facet of me. And do you, I mean, it, that's one of the things I think people who adopt a pseudonym really enjoy, though, that you can immerse yourself into the characters you're writing under that pseudonym. Whereas if you're going to be Madeline Wickham, and maybe in some of your other books, um, it's a, a little different. You know, if you're writing a, a novel by Madeline Wickham, you can put on that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it was, they're just very different styles. And I think when I am Sophie, it is... It, it is a definite part of me, and it's um, it, it's reflected in the way I write these books. They're very they're very direct. They're very confessional. They're you know they're quite personal. I write random thoughts, which are basically my thoughts, and you know I kind of give them to my heroines. Um, and I think I needed a bit of confidence before I could do this. So when I wrote my first book, I was a 24 year old financial journalist. 
But I did not want to write the autobiographical first novel about a 24-year-old financial journalist. I, I just didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a grown-up writer who writes about other things, not just themselves. And, uh, you know, I was, I was trying to kind of prove myself. So I wrote a novel about 30, 40 somethings and their concerns and parenthood and all kinds of things. And I think, you know, a few years went by and then I had the confidence to say, okay, relax. Let's write the confessional, autobiographical novel about the 24-year-old financial journalist. Um, and doing it under a pseudonym also gave me a confidence to just be completely honest. And if it's a total failure, then I'll just pretend it has nothing to do with me. So it's all good. <laughs> and I think we mentioned before, too, that you submitted that book using your pseudonym to your own publisher. Yeah. They not knowing that, yeah. that it was even you. Well, they had no idea I was doing it, um, partly because I just couldn't think of how to explain it to them, you know. Well, I thought I'd write this book about shopping. I mean, at the time, this just seemed like a nuts idea. It's gonna be about visa bills, and I think it'll be funny, but I mean, I just, the, the whole idea just made me cringe. So I thought, no, I won't tell them, I'll just write it. And then I thought, oh, but then they'll feel obliged to be nice about it, because it's me, and I don't want that. I, either they like it or they don't like it. I want them to just judge it for what it is. So I, I and it was just an instinct. It was a different voice, it felt like a new start. I just sent it in. And, um, oh, my, my editor and I actually had drinks together the night before the Shopaholic manuscript arrived at the publishers. So then everybody's reading it, and, and, and then one person knew that it was an established author. So he said, you know what, this is, this is an author. Who do you think it is? And my editor actually guessed me, but then she said, but no, no, I was having drinks with Maddie last night. She couldn't have kept that secret all night. It can't be her. <laughs> I felt so bad. You're good. <laughs> I told her. Well, speaking of out for drinks, you suggest walking and drinking cocktails mm. as a cure for getting stuck? Yeah. yeah stuck. It is, it just, well, I have a real belief that walking somehow triggers something in your brain because the minute I start to walk, you know, the solution will come, that will come to me. Um, I can sit and stare at a screen for two hours, and I always fall into, the, you know, I, I dole out this advice, but it's not like I always follow it. I, I fall into the trap of grimly sitting, trying to get, make a scene work. You know, the line won't come, I know what I want to do, but I can't achieve it, and I'm sitting there, and I refuse to let, and eventually I give up, walk to the door, and it all falls into place in my head. And I'm convinced that there's something in the motion of your body which makes your brain work. They need to do a study on this. And I'm also convinced that, that, that cocktails are the answer. Um, because I go out with my husband, we order a jug of cocktails, and we just go, right, you know, how are we going to fix this? And we talk and talk and talk and generally start laughing. And, you know, I don't always come up with the perfect solution, but I always find some sort of solve or some sort of progression, even if it's not the whole way. And we have a really nice night, so it's all good. You know, you mentioned that you're publishing your first YA young adult novel in mm. 2015. It's called Finding Audrey. Finding Audrey. I, and I know that you have children between the ages of 2 and 18, did your kids influence this at all? Do you now that you have young adults? They did. They did. I mean, it's um, there's there's a lot of themes in the book, and um, one of the themes is um, teenage boys and their love of computer games. And I would be lying if I said that this had not come <laughs> from personal experience. And actually, I thought Hannah's piece about technology was just so relevant. And I, <laughs> you know, um, this is exactly the, the themes I've been writing about in, in Finding Audrey. Um, you know, with comedy, but also I think there's a, there's a, there's a real thing out there. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I have this great big family. Of course they influence, mm -hmm. they influence what I write. Funnily enough, when I wrote, wrote Becky having a daughter, I didn't have a daughter. And now I have a two-year-old daughter like Becky. Again, it comes true. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie, you are on a book tour right now. You've been on lots of book tours before, and I'm sure people ask you the same questions over and over and over again. Is there anything that you would like us to ask you? Or Do you anything know, can like I tell you, about? you already did. You said, would you like a glass of wine? <laughs> that was a good start. Right? Nobody ever asked me this before. This is the best event, so thank you. <laughs> 
Well, uh, we, are, we would love for you to read, if you could, uh, a short excerpt from the book, which is available in the lobby. It's on sale tonight, uh, Shopaholic to the Stars. We'd love for you to do that. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, now, the scene I'm going to read comes from the middle of the book. Um, it's about Hollywood, so I thought I would read the bit that's on a movie set, because, hello, you know, L.A., it's got to be. Um, so I just need to sort of tell you that in, in the book, Becky and her best friend Suze have wangled parts as extras in a movie, which they are beyond excited about. Um, Suze is desperate to be an actress. She thinks she should have been an actress, so she's really excited, and Becky just thinks it's really, really cool. Um, they have not yet got to the stage of being the extras. They are being shown around the set by a publicist because it turns out that um, Suze's husband is, is quite rich and well-connected, so they're being treated as special guests. So here they are on the movie set. Actually, they've already... The director and the writer. I, I can't read you that, but it would be too long. But anyway, so this is the, the starting point. And now they're on the set, and we'll see how that goes. I'm not going to do the American accents, by the way. I tried that at home in the mirror. It really wasn't good. So I'm afraid everybody has to be British in this version. We're standing on a real movie set. It's quite small, but really well designed, with shelves of books and a table with ornaments and a fake window with a velvet curtain. Excuse me, says Don as his phone buzzes. I must take this call. He steps off the set and Suze sits in Lady Violet's chair. Kidnapped, she says in a mournful voice. Kidnapped. Really good, I say. Do you think Lady Violet's dress is a bit bunchy? I think it could be more flattering. I might tell the wardrobe person. <laughs> Kidnapped, says Suze again, and stares out to the camera, extending her hands as though she's on a massive London stage, and that's the audience. Oh, my God, kidnapped. Will our nightmare never end? Everything looks so realistic, I say, trailing my hand over a row of fake book spines. Look at this cupboard. I rattle the door, but it's stuck fast. It looks so real, but it's fake, like everything. I wander over to the little table. I mean, look at these cakes. They look totally real. They even smell real. It's so clever. They might be real, points out Suze. Of course they're not real. Nothing on a film set is real. Look, I lift one up confidently and take a bite out of it. It was real. <laughs> I have a mouthful of sponge and cream. Bex, Suze is staring at me in consternation. That cake is in the film. You can't eat it. I didn't mean to, I say defensively. I feel slightly outraged. They shouldn't have real cakes on a movie set. It goes against the whole spirit of the thing. I look around, but no one seems to have seen me. What shall I do now? I can't put half a cake down on the table. OK, we're going again, comes a booming voice. Clear the set. Oh, God, the actors are returning, and I have half a cake in my hands. Maybe they won't notice. I hastily sneak off the set my hands behind my back, and find a place where I'm almost hidden behind a stone pillar. The two actors are sitting back down on the chairs, and everyone is gathering for a new take. Wait a minute. A girl, dressed all in black, comes running onto the set. She squints into the screen of a little camera, then peers at the table. What happened to the other cake? Damn. The actors are looking around blankly, as though they hadn't even realized there were any cakes in the shot. Cake, says the man at last. Yes, cake. There should be six. She jabs at her camera screen. What happened to it? Well, don't look at me, says the man, sounding affronted. I never saw the cake. Yes, you did. I think there were five, says the actress playing Lady Violet. Excuse me, says the girl in black tightly. If I say there were six, then there were six. And unless you want to reshoot everything we've done this morning, then I suggest you don't move the props around. I didn't move anything around, retorts Lady Violet. I have to confess. Go on, Becky. I force myself to step forward onto the edge of the set and clear my throat. Um, excuse me, I say awkwardly. It's here. Sorry. I proffer my hand 
and everyone stares at the half-eaten, crummy cake. My cheeks are flaming with embarrassment, especially when a chunk falls on the floor. I quickly bend to get it, feeling worse than ever. Shall I put it back on the table? I venture. We could hide the eaten side. The girl in black raises her eyes to mine disbelievingly. You ate a prop? I didn't mean to, I say hurriedly. I thought it was fake, and I was just biting it to prove it. I knew it wasn't fake, puts in Suze. I told her. I said, no fake cake could be that good. <laughs> yes, it could, I object. They have amazing modern technology. Not that amazing. Anyway, a thought suddenly occurs to me. Maybe it's a good thing, because would they actually have that many cakes? I appeal to Anne, the director. Six is a lot for two people. <laughs> you don't want them to look greedy, do you? You don't want the audience thinking, no wonder Lady Violet needs a corset if she's eating all these cakes. <laughs> Enough, Ant flips out. Get these girls off my set. He glares at Don. I don't care who they are, they're banned. Banned? Suze and I exchange shocked looks. But we're going to be extras. Whether they get to be extras or not, you will have to read the book and see. <laughs> thank you so much, thank you. Oh, there you all are, hi. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sophie Kinsella. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Sophie is going to take your questions, so if you would like to raise your hands and Roger with the microphone, we'll find you. And when the mic comes to you, please stand and say your name and then proceed with your question. Don't be shy, just raise your hands. <laughs> We have somebody upstairs. Somebody coming to you. Just say. Hi, Twenties Girl was one of our favorite books. Could you tell us how the idea, how you got the idea for that? Oh, thank you. Oh, the question. If you didn't hear, oh, you knew, of course you had it. There's a mic about Twenties Girl. Um, uh, this is a book that I wrote featuring a ghost. And do you know how it came about? My agent said to me, and I think it was an offhand remark, she just said, you know what, you should write a ghost story. I thought, a ghost story? Oh, I've never thought of that. You know, I don't really read paranormal stories. I, I, I don't, you know, it's not, it's not in what I read or what I thought of doing, but this idea stuck with me, a ghost, a ghost. My God, that would be so much fun. And I was thinking, well, what kind of ghost? And what era, and you know, who would this be? And I'm quite fascinated with the 20s. I love that era. And I think the girls from the 20s were just amazing. Sort of feisty flappers, cutting off all their hair, shocking society. And so this idea came to me of a feisty flapper ghost coming to disrupt her own funeral um, and interrupting it. And, and so she does, it's her own funeral, and she pops up and starts badgering her great niece and won't leave her alone and comes into her life and has a sort of mission that the great niece has to help her with. And, and that was how it started. Um, and I think I wanted a friendship. And, and so part of the, the sort of story is this friendship that comes between a, a 20s girl and a girl, a modern girl, and their different outlooks in life. Um, and Sadie, who is the, the 20s flapper, kind of starts counseling Lara, the heroine, on her love life and how she should dress and starts bossing her around. Um, and, you know, this juxtaposition for me was just, it was wonderful. And actually the friendship, I think, was, was the sort of the main the main journey of the book. And I have to tell you, I, I cry when I finish any book, really, because I usually have some sort of cathartic ending and, you know, people hugging each other or whatever. And, um, and I'm always really sad to say goodbye to my characters, actually. So when I get to the end, and if any, any book, I'm like, oh, I've got to leave you. I, you know, I don't want to leave you. But when I wrote The End of Twenties Girl, I was in bits because it's such a goodbye. I mean, I don't want to ruin the ending, but it's quite an emotional ending. 
And it, for me, it's a very special book, but it felt like such an experiment that it's lovely for me when people say it's their favorite book. Because believe me, it's not, it's not uncomplicated writing a ghost. As I found out when I got to copy edits, and they were saying, well, what are the rules of this ghost? Is she, can she, her arm go through a door? But is it going through a door there? And can she sit on a chair? And, and I hadn't really thought all this through. You know, if you write fantasy or ghosts, there are the rules of the world, and I just kind of written it. So I had to kind of think, oh, God, okay, let's just think about this more carefully. And it was, you know, it was a challenge, writing a ghost, but it was, it was a wonderful challenge. So thank you. Okay, we have someone over here. Hi, my name is Jesse, and I was just wondering, did you ever have any initial fears about being published and putting your work out there for the world? Hi, Jesse, that is such a good question. Um, I think I was just so excited to finish a book um, and share it that I kind of thought, well, you know what? If the experts say that I can publish this, then it must be all right. And I think I just put my faith in. I mean, no, nobody thinks their work is any good, really. I mean, that's the honest truth. You, you kind of write a book, and then you see it churning out of the printer. Well, in the old days, you did. Now you send a file. Actually, no, that's a lie. I still print it out, and I send it to my editors with ribbons around it, because that's just the kind of person I am. Um, but, and you think, you catch a phrase or a paragraph, and you think, oh, really? Really? Oh, I don't know, you know, mm, because, you know, it's really hard to judge your own work. It's so hard, and I've, I feel the same thing if I hear my audio books. I'm like, really, did I write that? Oh dear, oh, I'm not sure, you know. And I think you have to get beyond that and think, no, someone else is telling me this is worth publishing, and I'm just gonna have to trust them. Um, and that's what their job is. Because if it were us, we'd probably be taking our book down, you know, off the shelves every six months, rewriting it, saying that bit was rubbish, I'm going to, you know. And you can't do that. You kind of just have to say, that is it. Move on. That's a piece of work. And now I'm going to go and do another piece of work. And, you know, onward and upward, really. So we have another question up in the balcony. Hi, Hi. I'm Rochelle. I Hi. read, uh, uh, I've got your number. Oh, right, thank you. And what really shocked me in reading it, I couldn't put it down, was how um, honest the character was. And I wanted to ask you about, uh, was it, is that something you had to learn to uh, be honest to that degree? And the second thing that shocked me about the book is how I, it was laugh out loud. Oh, well, thank you. funny <laughs> scenes, like the, when she's getting the fake ring and then the people are raising their eyebrows. <laughs> that was so funny. But <laughs> I'm so glad you're laughing. That's made my day. <laughs> <laughs> but could you talk about uh, how did you develop that ability to be so honest? Did it just come to you? And also those laugh out loud scenes. Um, well, honest, you know, I think it, it took a while to have the courage to be honest. Like I say, when I first started writing, it was at a bit of a distance. I was writing about people kind of a bit removed from me. I was writing in the third person, which is very handy for plotting, I find, but is a little bit distancing. And I think it took me a few years to kind of get up the courage to say, I'm just gonna write stuff down, and you know what? People might think it's funny, or they might not. Let's just see, you know, I, I can't second guess that. And, you know, it's honest, but it's, it's a kind of, it's a filtered honest. It's, it's my character being honest. It's not, which sometimes is me, but it, it is filtered. So I'm, it's not honest like these people that, you know, invite a camera into their homes and, you know, we watch them getting undressed. It's not that. It is fiction. Um, but, it, but, it, but it comes from an honest place. And I think I had to have the kind of confidence of having written several books See, you know, you, you put a bit of yourself into each book and it's like you just put it out there and, and then you get the kind of guts to, I'm going to put a bit more out, a bit more. Okay, now I'm going to say what I really thought last week. What an embarrassing thought that was. Well, I'm just going to put it out there. And when I created Becky Bloomwood, I can remember thinking, God, are people just going to look at me and say, my God, is that how your mind works? <laughs> really? And it was a risk. And I did actually feel nervous. But I just thought, well, you know what, if they do, then so what? Because I think I just had that experience and I was just a bit older and I could think, I, you know, 
so what? My children won't mind. That's what I always think when I'm getting anxious about things. I think, will my children mind? No, they won't, so it's fine. That's my only frame of reference that matters to me, really. Um, and, and in terms of laughter, you know, well, thank you. I mean, I just, I just try to write funny scenes, and I think of ridiculous situations, and I just try and write them the best I can. And I do rewrite the scenes. You know, I'll have the idea... I'll write it, I'll rewrite it, I'll rewrite it, I'll rewrite it. Because it's all about, for me, it's all about timing. And you, you can't get that the first time. You, you know how the scene should go, but the actual beats, the rhythm, and I think, you know, I think music actually is a great way to start for writing because the rhythm and beats and punchlines, it's all about timing. And that's... That's all I can say. I don't really know how I do it. I just kind of think of something silly and write it as best I can and hope it makes you laugh. I mean, that's, that's it. But I think timing for me is a really crucial element. We have somebody over here. Hi, I just wanted to say, um, when you were talking earlier about when you go in and you're writing and you're right in the thick of the book and your parenting style kind of changes a little bit and you're... <laughs> You're in the yes. zone. When your books come out, my parenting style also changes a little bit until I get to the end of the novel. <laughs> it's like, here, kids, eat this pizza. I'm reading. That is wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, you and me. Yeah, kindred yeah. spirits. <laughs> that aside, um, do you laugh when you're writing these funny scenes? I mean, do you, in your room, when the door is shut, and you think of something really funny, do you laugh as you're typing it out? Yeah, I do. Okay. I mean, I and laugh I at myself. I think I'm funny. I don't publish anything, so I don't know if anybody else thinks I'm funny, but I sure think I'm funny. <laughs> so I wondered if you, do you know, do you think it's funny? And you're like, well, I think it's funny. So. I had to just write it to please myself. I rewrite the scene until it makes me laugh out loud. And occasionally I will have an idea. I mean, not long ago I had an idea, and I can't even think what it was now, but it made me laugh. I was walking down the street, and every time I thought of it, I started laughing. And people were giving me these strange looks. <laughs> But it just, it made me so happy to think of this scene and it was going to be so much fun to write. And it's kind of my test. Did it make me laugh? You know, when it makes me laugh, then it, then it works and I can move on. So, yeah. And then sometimes I cry. It's up and down. Oh, it's a roller coaster. Just a second. Um, a long time before I read your books, I read P.G. Woodhouse, and I wondered, he puts himself, his characters in, in uh, situations a lot like yours as far as being absurd. I wondered whether he was any influence on you or whether you'd read him. Or I love P.G. Woodhouse so much. But the funny thing was, I didn't start reading P.G. Woodhouse until a few years ago, and I had started, I'd written several shopaholic books and... Um, several of the standalones, and people kept saying to me, P.G. Woodhouse, have, you know, you must be... Do you know, a journalist once came to interview me, she was German, and she had put this whole theory together that, that um, Sophie Kinsella was my real name, and I had invented Madeline Wickham from P.G. Woodhouse novel characters. She, she thought I had done this, because there's a Madeline Bassett, and there's a Wickham, some... And she saw the affinity, and she couldn't believe. And I said, well, no, I've never actually read any P.G. Woodhouse. She couldn't believe it. And when I started reading P.G. Woodhouse, I was like, oh, I can see now why everybody says this. Because this is exactly my kind of humor, my kind of silly situations, even ridiculous aunts popping up here and there. Um, and so, you know, now that I would totally aspire to write as, as joyfully as P.G. Woodhouse. I, you know, and I, and, I, and I read him for pleasure a lot. We have another one up in front. Um, my name is Sabrina, and how long does it take to write your books? Hi. Um, that's a tricky question, because if I date it from sort of first initial little idea, it could be a few years, really, because I, I have all sorts of ideas that are kind of percolating, and I haven't quite got to them yet. But when I actually sit down and write, okay, this is my project, this is what I'm doing, it's kind of about nine months. Um, it's kind of a bit like a baby. Um, <laughs> equally hard. No one else can do it for you. Um, and, um, 
you know, and, and ideally, I would just be uninterrupted. I mean, you know, life being what it is, I, I get interrupted. I sort of, you know, other books come out, and I come on tour, and I, you know, so it might, I might, it might take a bit longer depending on what's happening, but I think that's the kind of, for me, that's the gestation period. I could not take five years over a novel. I would go insane. I'm so impatient. I want to know what happens. I mean, these people that spend a long time and craft a wonderful work, I am full of admiration, but I do not have that patience. So once I start, I'm quite fast. I'm like, come on, enough already. What, what happens? I need to know. I think we have time for one more question. Anyone? Hello, my name is Karen. Hi. My question is, whenever you have a new shopaholic book, I feel like my best friend Becky is back. I love it. That's I, so she, nice, thank you. She goes with me shopping, and, but I love your standalones. My question is, when you're writing your standalones, is Becky there visiting She's totally well? there, she's totally there, she totally exists. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really feel like she's a, a person and that the, there's a kind of parallel world where Becky is just living and getting on with her life. And, and so when I, when I sort of start a new book, it doesn't feel like, who was that girl again? And it's just like, I feel I'm stepping into this sort of stream of, of living which is going on and I'm just joining it, really, and picking up the threads and off we go. Um, and she is at the back of my mind. She, you know, she is the con the constant character, um, and I mean, when I'm actually writing her, I do become a bit more like her, <laughs> um, and then and then she sort of fades away slightly, and I can deal with another heroine, but she's always there. Well, thank you so much. Thank Sophie you. Kinsella. This has been so lovely. <laughs> and can I just say? Thank can you I, very can much. I, can I just say, I have so loved being here. I love this, this amazing venue. I love the lovely town and the lovely shops, and I can't believe I can't stay here longer. <laughs> so thank you so much, and I want to come back. It's so nice. Yeah.